The Coonhound Collective Podcast is brought to you by CZ Welding and Custom Dog Boxes. Dog boxes built by hunters for hunters. Check these guys out today. This is your host, Jason Snurgrove, and I will be your guide as we journey down the road to pleasure hunt or hitting the long trail to those great cop hunts. This is the Coonhound Collective <laughs> Welcome to the Coonhound Collective Podcast today. Today, we're going to talk some red bone dogs with Mr. Adrian Strickland. Adrian, how's it going today? It's doing good. How about you? Oh, pretty good. It's a beautiful day here in the Ozarks. We've had some some ice and some snow here in the past week, but it's all about melted off and the sun shining. So that's a that's a good thing for sure. Yeah, it's a little bit better than it is here. Ain't doing nothing but raining down here in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of North Carolina, won't you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of kind of where you're from there? Um, I grew up thirty miles east of Raleigh, which is the center of North Carolina. So I'm about thirty miles east of Raleigh. Um, started coon hunting when I was 11, 12 years old, like most kids. Started with my my father's cousins, actually, the first ones that brought me coon hunting years ago. And uh, we've always had deer dogs and run deer dogs down here. And um, so I've always been around hounds, but coon dogs is always, from that first night was, was the bug had bit me, like they always like to say, I fell in love with the sport of coon hunting. Yeah. Um, um, before you go on there, you said east of Raleigh. So are you kind of in rolling hills or are you down in swamps altogether? I'm actually in a mixture. Um, right around the house, we got a few little rolling hills. I go, And I can go 15 minutes from me and be hunting swamps where you need a boat to hunt out of. It kind of just depends on where I'm at. I'm in a good mixture where I'm at right here in this part of the state. Yeah, I, I uh, work for a company that done tree trimming for utility lines and i I work quite a few ice storms in south carolina and north carolina so i know there's there's kind of a middle ground area there where you kind of hit hit both yeah that'd be right where i'm located at right in the middle of it all right in all the action which is good kind of gets the dog prepared for about anything you could throw at it yeah, that's definitely, a, you know, a benefit. You're talking about getting dogs prepared, you know, especially to go travel and comp hunt and stuff. And, you know, I, I'm I'm from South Alabama originally, and so we had row crop and not really not really any type of mountain and stuff, but a lot of swamp and stuff like that. And I lived in Illinois, and it was kind of the same deal. It was row crop and, you know, a little bit of river bottom stuff, stuff like that. But where I live here now is just kind of, you know, mountainous and, and rocky and, you don't really get into into any swamps, but I can I can drive a little bit north and get in a row crop, and a little bit west and uh, and get into a, a, a few swamps. Nothing like nothing like what I was used to down south. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I like the mixture. It's it's kind of you know it's challenging when you hunt the swamps, and then if I'm trying to go to a hunt up north or where I'm going to have to be in a lot crop land, I'll hit my land there. That's more suited to that territory yeah you know wh- while we're on that subject we're, we're going to talk about your dogs and and stuff like that here in a minute but you know I, wh- whenever you get get into those swampy areas it, it just it's a different mindset uh for, for me anyway and the dog has to operate a little bit different to uh to really succeed in, in that kind of conditions yeah I, I know when we hunt the swamps a lot then yeah. You know, when a coon does swim across the swamps, you know, the scent will kind of drift around in the water. And that takes some adjustment a lot for a lot of dogs to kind of adjust to be able to track in that type of terrain. But they also uh, got to be able to get the feet wet. I've seen a lot of dogs come from out of state that's never been around that kind of water, and it kind of blows their minds a lot, you know, to have to get submerged in water like that and go. 
Yeah, and, and you know, whenever I was hunting swamps back in Alabama, I mean, there was a lot of times dogs would be swimming around trees. And my uh, when I got back into coon hunting uh, after moving to this part of Missouri, I'd been back into coon hunting, but we bought a farm here and was had a place to actually have a dog. And that first dog I got, which he passed away at a young dog, was making a was making making a nice young dog. He he was not a fan of water at all, uh, which was different for me. He was used to these shallow running creeks. If we got over around some deep water, I mean, it would have to be a sure enough hot track to to drag him out in it. He did not like it. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of been a challenge for a lot of young dogs I've had throughout the years is getting used to the water. You know, like you said, I've had some that just never was their cup of tea to be able to hunt in them swamps. And then I've had some that just seems like that's what they look for. I could turn them out on dry ground and they won't happen until they found some water. Yeah. To hunt on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, um, T- tell us about the the first coon hound you remember having. What what was it? A red bone? I, I know we haven't said that, but that's what we're going to talk about today is the red bone line of dogs that you hunt. Um, what was that first dog a red bone? Did you have something else? No, I actually started uh, with grade blue ticks. Um, first two hounds I had as a boy, I, I said I started around 11, 12 years old. They were both grade blue ticks. I had a young one that um uh, was making up. A fine hound, and he uh he got killed at an early age, and uh, my daddy kind of looked around and found me a a gray blue tick male, an older male that was running tree and some, and uh he made a fair dog for for a young kid at that age. It was like I I felt like I had won the lottery. <laughs> it was a uh, he taught me a lot, you know. I had a lot of good times with him. Yeah, well, I can definitely relate to that. You know, you get that that first dog that's yours, and it actually goes out and trees coons. Boy, you you, you think you're on top of the world uh, for sure. So, fr- from that dog, did you immediately go into red bones, or was there anything in between? No, uh, from that dog, actually, the red bone. My love for red bones fell along. Like I said, we always raised up running deer dogs, and uh, a guy in my club actually had a red bone in his area that had got hung up one of his deer dogs and uh as a kid he had raised a litter of puppies for deer dogs and one of them was just as pretty a red bone as you've ever seen in your life and from that day on when i laid my eyes on that dog that's the i knew that was the type of dog i wanted the dog i wanted and uh lo and behold some years later you know when i did get into red bones and i had been in them for years i come to find out that the dog that I have fell in love with was actually one of the same line of dogs that I'm hunting today. I just didn't know what it took me 15 years or more before we ever figured out that they were the same off the same blue line of dogs. Okay. Well, won't you, won't you tell us about that bloodline uh, of dogs kind of, you said, you know, they were from that same line. What, what is that line of red dogs that you, that you're hunting now? Um, the line there's a local line of dogs down here and uh before we go too far let me uh i couldn't have done none of this without my wife you know i've been with her since high school and she's been along the way with me and uh is really affected and kept my mind set on which way i want to breed the dogs and which way to go i've always conversed with her on what i want to do with these line of dogs but uh i do have her sitting here with me introduce yourself our name is becky I better have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I always say that there's there, there's always friends and, and coon hunters around that usually help a help a successful person out. But the the one that's at home behind the doors that's that that you're talking to at night about dogs and sometimes they they probably don't even care to hear about it. That's the ones that that are really the the best support system. Yeah, she's the brains behind operations. Well, I like to tell. <laughs> but he got his first red bone um, before we got married. We got married at nineteen, and um, the blue ticks that he was talking about earlier, he sold those uh, while we were dating. And I kind of felt guilty about it because he he said, you know, he just didn't have enough time to hunt, um, like he felt like he should. So he sold them. And so a couple of years later, I said, why don't you get you another coon dog? And so at that point in time. 
he had kind of made his mind up he wanted a red bone and so we looked and looked and he stayed up for what six months to buy that oh yeah i was broke <laughs> <laughs> and so we ended up buying a red bone um, puppy and that's kind of where where it all started um her name was alice she she ended up being my dog um because she wasn't making what he wanted and so um, i ended up kind of taking her over but um anyway our line kind of goes back to her a little bit so yeah, she she the she was the start of the red bone the Alice dog she mentioned. She was the first registered dog I'd ever had in my life. And uh even hunting with my, my cousins coming up, they were uh always just grade dogs. They were hide hunters, so if it treated coon, that's all that mattered, because that's all we were after was coon pelts back then. But uh yeah, yeah, she was the first registered dog and that's what we've built our line today off of her. Yeah, and you know, back in the back in the day, they they didn't really care what it was out of, what it was mixed with, as long, long as it performed to their standards of what they were wanting to do with the dog. That's that's kind of what what the old timers look for, and you know, I I, I think through pedigrees and and, and some different breedings, we we've kind of got it you know narrowed down, and that's kind of that's kind of how me and you got talking. You had posted a. Uh, so some questions or I guess maybe more food for thought on, on Facebook and I read it and I thought thought some of that was uh was pretty good about, you know, what traits you're looking for in a dog and talking about some of the, the traits that you like and what you look for in a dog and I, I, I think you got some pretty decent feedback on it. Yeah, that's kind of mentality I've always brought along it. You know, I learned grew up hunting with them. You always were, we were looking for what we were in a dog performance wise. And I've always just kind of transitioned that and kept it the same. You know, we don't harvest no way as many coons no more because they just ain't no need to. But I've always got, I've got more enjoyment now trying to get all the, all I can out of a dog performance wise. And that seems to be the thing I enjoy most out of it now is just watching a dog develop and get better and better as the years go on. So in this line of dogs that that you're that you have there, are are you line breeding these dogs? Are you having to outcross very much to to hold on to those traits that you're looking for, or are they are they seeming to pass them pass them on uh, generation after generation pretty consistently? Um, I've done, I've done a lot of line breeding throughout the years. I've uh I've never been a big I've never called myself a big time breeder. Um, I know a lot of guys have probably done more for the breed for breeding standards, you know, and than I have, cause I've never really considered myself a breeder. I've only bred when I wanted dogs myself, but, um, I've, I've line bred them a lot. And then when they get so tied up, you know, I've done some out crosses on dogs that were similar to what I like or had the traits that I like in them and then go back, and try to line breed it and seal it. Cause I've always been taught, the seal, uh, the seal the traits in the line of dogs, you have to line breed. That'll kind of lock in what you're looking for. That was always the mentality I was taught, whether it was right or wrong. That's the way I was taught to do it. Yeah. So when you're bringing that, are you going, how, how close are you getting when you're line breeding? Are you going uncle niece? Are you going granddad, great granddad or, or and granddaughter? Or how, how are you, uh, how are you doing that? I I like to do a lot of half brother and sister crosses, and uh, I'm planning on doing some grandfather back to grandchildren. But the best one I've had out of all the years I've hunted, it was an accident. But uh, she was actually a a mother to son uh, cross. It was an accident, and we raised them, but she ended up making the best dog I've, I've ever snatched at the end of my league. But uh, okay. I still have some of her blood in in my in my stuff here. So whenever you, you you're line breeding and you see that you need to outcross, are are you talking to people? Or are you just are you hunting with other dogs that are around there? How are you finding those dogs with with the correct traits that you need to bring in to, um, I guess amplify what what you have. I'll talk to a lot of folks, and believe it or not, a lot of folks I talk to are actually hunters of the other breeds that's hunting against these dogs, because they'll uh, 
a lot of times they'll give you more of an honest, honest take, you know, on what a dog is. I've, I've talked to a lot of guys, you know, that's hunted other breeds. It's, I've, I've known that's hunted against some of these lines of dogs and, and find out about them. And, you know, a lot of times they'll tell you, you know, you're a coon hunter like I am. If you go to a hunt and if you draw a, let's say you're an English dog hunter, a walker dog man, and you draw a black and tan that really look good, and you go around and say, hey, I'd feed that dog, or that's that's one of the nicest ones I've been with, that's that's saying a lot to me, you know, to get a man that's to hunt a different breed of dog to say that about a about a different breed. Yeah, I agree with you there. That's that's probably some of the uh some of the best breeding advice that's probably I've ever heard is, you know, a man that's hunting hunting a different breed of dog that draws out with with the breed of dog that you're looking to outcross on that gives you that that type of advice i don't i don't think he's trying to steer you wrong for sure because most of the time that's the that's the straight honest opinion of of someone there of you know if if they're willing to speak up because not all people but you know some people get to be you know colorblind in their own breed and they don't want to see any any other other way and hey to each your own that's the reason why there are seven different breeds that we can we can pick through to to hunt and do what we want to so, so so we all have our our own opinions and there's you know the x breed that that people like too and you know but for for whoever that is to say hey i draw that that red red bone the other night and boy i'm tell you what it i I would i would hunt a red bone if i had one that looked like that that's that that's probably the best advice out there and the thing about red bones you know they're they're in the minority and so in our area you know we don't strive to compete against red bones because you're not if you if that's your goal you're not going to hunt against any of them so i mean the people that we hunt with on a regular basis hunt walkers they hunt english dogs and so we want our red bones to compete with them and so you know when adrian talks about breeding he he's got a lot of advice from um mr Irwin massingill who passed away recently and then mr kent spencer and you know those people and because we want our line to one day Um, hopefully live up to what those are Um, and you know we don't want to just compete against red bones we want to compete against everybody yeah well uh, i'm gonna say this i'm probably gonna have some buddies that after this airs i'll get some phone calls or text messages from (laughs) but i'm gonna go ahead and say it um (laughs) it don't matter where you go in the country the walker breed is dominantly the dog that shows up and on Coon Hunting University podcast, I, I've and I think I've mentioned this before. They were uh, I don't even remember who it was that they were talking talking to, but he drew Barry Kitty uh, on a Saturday night and Sunday his dog come in heat. And that Saturday night, I guess him and Barry Kitty had a knockdown, drag out argument out on the cast. But when his dog come in heat, there was no question where he was taking that dog to get bread, and that was up to Barry Kitty's house, and. Maybe not all the time, but I, I think some of the times in, in other places that they just, the Walker breed has just made their mind up. We're going to be successful. We're going to do whatever it takes, breed ever how we got to to breed, to, to make a dog that we can go out and compete with day in, day out, every weekend, during the week, whatever it takes to win. And maybe there's pockets here and there of, of the breed that's done that. Um, whether it be red bone or English, black and tan, whatever, but overall as a, as a group in each breed, I, I don't think, I don't think we've done, done that. I, I know with, I hunt English dogs and there's pockets in the English dogs, but overall as a group, we, we, we have not done what, what the Walker dogs have done for sure. No, no, I agree with you a hundred percent. They are. And I'm about like you, I'm going to probably catch the brief over this but they're a lot of years ahead of breeding techniques and everything in front of everybody they they don't do no no line blindness i've seen that in a lot of the other breeds they've been a lot of kind of kennel blindness and and a lot of that's starting to the fade i've seen it's getting better but um we got some catching up to do <laughs> yeah that's that's for sure well let's back up for just a second here and when did you enter your first competition hunt um I was probably 21 or so. 2021, I I went for years. I didn't even know that they had no more night hunts. You know, it was kind of 
I was, as a boy, read the Fool Crowd magazines that my cousins had. I always thought that it had gone away. But uh, as I got older, I, I had run into some other coon hunters and found out about them. And uh, at that point in time, I actually had a dog that's, he's not in my line of dogs because he passed before he could have puppies. But I went back and uh, got a puppy off a litter mate brother to him that I run into hunts when I first started. His name was Onion. And he's been dead now for 20 years, but they still, they still talk about him. He's kind of been, even the Walker guys from the old days, love that little dog to death. He's kind of like what you said when the dogs are, they just, he was one they talked up a lot. And uh, I went to my first hunt and he was the dog that never was the way I like to say it. Cause I was green in the sport. I didn't know much. I could, I wasn't very good. I still ain't a very good handler today, but, uh, I could never win nothing with the dog. <laughs> we we give him a hard time. It was hard to beat us, but I never could come away with a win with the dog. He ended up dying as a rescue dog, but but they uh they thought the world of him around here. That little dog did. Yeah, that's you know that's part of the battle. You know, you have a good dog that can go out and perform, and um, I know myself. I'm not the great greatest handler, and sometimes I I hurt my my own dog. You know more so than than anybody else in the cast so i can definitely relate to that yeah i've gotten uh gotten better the older <laughs> i've been, i've uh i've paid my lessons 20 dollars at a time i about i about learned everything you can learn at it now i spend enough money i've learned it <laughs> yeah so what kind of are you predominantly ukc hunting pkc hunting what what, what kind of are you doing a mixture of both how's that working out there I predominantly UKC hunt. I do dabble in PKC. I used to do a lot of AKC hunting when it was trying to get hot and heavy again back in the mid 2000s. But uh, then it's it's kind of dropped off in our area. So I've gone back to UKC. I've I've dabbled at trying to get back into PKC, but I'm self employed and it's hard to, for me to get going on the weeknight going everywhere because I got a long day's work the next day in front of me. So I've always kind of liked the weekend hunts. Yeah, well, I definitely definitely understand that, and that's the reason why there's a mixture out there, so you can kind of you can kind of pick and choose what what works out best for you. So after Onion, there, what what uh did you already have a pup coming along, or did you have to go out and hunt you something to to get going again? Um, actually, we had bred Alice to a a dog. I might have had to back up. I kind of jumped a little bit with Onion, but I had a dog. Alice, I had her going, and I went and got another dog as a pup, and uh, got him going, and end up getting him bred to Alice just before I bought Onion, which Onion come from the same man Don Whitley, where I had bought my Amos dog from, which was, which is what I bred to Alice, and they, uh, I was hunting, and Amos had passed, and we had uh. He knew I was passed, and Don called me, and that's when he sold me Onion. So I had, at that point in time, Onion. only had Onion about a year before he got struck and killed in the road by a car. But uh, at that time, I had Alice, which was, she was making a dog, making a good dog, just for what I considered a top competition dog. And I had that pup, which I named Rudy. And uh, when Onion got killed that night, I had, I had Alice and Rudy with me, and Rudy was in the road with Onion when he got struck. But uh, Rudy just the car didn't get Rudy; he just got Onion. But after that, I I started predominantly pushing Rudy and Alice. That's all I had, and we went on to make Alice a night champion in UKC, and uh, Rudy ended up being a a dog that was line bred off of a lot. He ended up making a an exceptional hound. He had a lot of speed to him. Not quite as much nose as I liked in the dog, but he had a whole lot of speed. And uh, he's what I mainly line bred off, my dogs off of today, was him. Okay, how do these how do these dogs operate in the woods? Are they blowing through the country? Are they hunt, hunting from the truck and going out as far as it takes? Or are they they kind of mixture of, of covering and by themselves? Or are they by themselves all the time or are they covering how, how are these dogs operating that you're hunting 
Um, a lot of them, they may have had a little bit of a mixture of both, but what I strive in for is, is uh, I, I want a dog when I cut it loose to, to start hunting in. I don't like one horse racing through the woods running past coons. You know, I feel like that's a waste. And uh, I want them to hunt in, and a lot of them that I've hunted throughout the years, they are, they take off hunting. You know, there ain't no straight line hunting. They're cutting back and forth in the woods so they find a piece of game to get after. But I have had some throughout the years that were the straight line type of dogs. I just never really bred into that much because that's not the style I like. And one thing he does not tolerate is a dog that will not hunt. The one that stands around your feet. Uh-uh. Yeah, no, I've had a lot of them get a, a bus ticket away from here. I, that's that's all I like to joke to folks. I'm coon hunting. Hunting is part of the word of coon hunting, so I want a dog that's going to go hunting. That's just the way I was raised up. <laughs> yeah, my... My stepdad is kind of who I coon hunted the, the most with, and he said, son, you can feed a good and just as good as you can feed a bad one. That's right. I believe the bad ones eat more than the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you're probably right there. Well, you know, that's I, I kind of like a dog that, you know, that, that ain't scared to hunt by himself, that, that likes to hunt. And this, this little male dog I got, you know, if you lay him up for a few days and take him, he, he'll bust through the country on you. But if you're hunting him hard, he'll kind of – he he never quits. He he hustles around and 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 uh, just kind of hunt hunts around you and, and starts working his way away from you until he finds a track. And that sounds like to me kind of what what you're what you're looking for there. Is, have you been pretty successful at, at being able to when you needed a pup be able to produce that for yourself? Yeah, I have. Um, like I said, I've been raising this now for a little bit over between twenty twenty five years. This exact same line of dogs I've had. A, here in the yard, and I've consistently had that type of dog. It, so I go through some puppies now to get there because I'm kind of demanding on a dog. I want a certain type of dog, and I want it to perform a certain way, and I I just won't accept it if it ain't. And uh, I've been consistently producing that. So whenever you have a, a litter of puppies there, you talked about going through some puppies – let, let's for just a moment let's talk about that process so you, you you've made a decision on whatever male you're going to cross on a female or or vice versa and you have a litter of puppies there um how, how are you picking the puppies that you're keeping are you keeping all the puppies to a certain age and kind of looking at how they act and um or, or you know how, how are you evaluating and keeping the puppies that you're keeping are you putting them in people's hands and then getting them back when they're older how, how's that working uh, I've been kind of fortunate. A lot of the dogs I've had throughout these years, they've always had small litters. I've had a lot of, I don't know why this line of dogs has been like that, but I've had a lot of three and four puppy litters. So I've been able to keep the bulk of the puppies and pick through them like I want. And then the ones I didn't, I put in, I've had enough people with interest over the years to want to hunt these dogs. I would get them to folks' hands that would uh, hunt them. And, you know, Sometimes I'd buy them back or I would, uh, you know, been able to use them as a resource to, to breed back into the line of dogs I got, you know. Yeah, that's, you know, whenever you're trying to, you know, keep something going, um, man, it's important to be able to to have people that you can, you know, get dogs in their hands and that they'll actually put some time in them in the woods so you can see what, what's going on with them and how they're going to perform and you know, it's just that that's a that's a big part of our sport. You know, especially if you're breeding to look look to get something for you and not breeding just to get rid of puppies. Yeah, and I've always that's the way I've always been. Whenever I wanted to breed, and I've a lot of my dogs. There's not a lot of them out there because I've never been like I said before a big time breeder. I've only bred when I want to. I've had a few outside females come in over the years, but I've never been what I call myself a big time breeder. I've always bred for myself and. Even if I've had folks chomping at the bit want puppies, I still would never breed a dog until I, I wanted one. I won't go breed her until I knew I wanted one myself. I won't go breed a female unless I was willing to hunt the puppy off that female myself. That's the way I always feel. So you had uh, Rudy, I think you said there. Um, what 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 dog did you go to uh after those two, uh, that male and female there, as you moved on up through the years, 
did you you have certain dogs that did, did you just keep one or two dogs around um you know to comp hunt and pleasure hunt with or did you have several that you could just go out there and pick through i've had a <laughs> my wife probably get me for this i've always had a a kennel lot full of dogs around here <laughs> i've always uh I've, the way i've done it i've stuck with my male dogs um the male dog i'm hunting today goes all the way back to amos directly right down the line i've always true to my male dogs where i've done a lot of my outcrosses is i would go by females off of different lines or or whatever, and I use them to cross back into with my male dog that I've had. That's how I've always done it. But, um, yeah, I've always, I've kept a, a bunch of young dogs here, and I'd windle down. I'd, pick, I'd keep what I want. I'd, I'd wield it down for a few years and push a dog for, in a hunt for a few years, and then once I get that dog as good as I could, I'd kind of pleasure hunt it and go back on the search of trying to find something to replace it with. Yeah, how how tough is it whenever you go back to find something to replace it with, especially when you've been satisfied with something? Oh, that's a tough struggle there. <laughs> that is a tough one. Um, I have it has taken me several years to come back up with another dog that uh that would satisfy me. You know, sometimes I'll I'll kind of disappear and I'll have a I'll have a good dog, but not what I consider that top tier dog. And uh, I still knock around the local hunts with it, but if until it, it takes me a little bit to go through one and find one just like I like. So as far as hunts, have you always just hunted local? Did you hunt the Grand American or is there any, what big hunts have you hunted at? Uh, yeah, I've hunted, uh, I do a lot of local hunting, but yeah, I've actually hunted the Grand American. Uh, the, the female I was telling you about earlier, the, the T dog, her name was Trudy. I always called her T. I actually made the final four of the Grand American with her in 2011. It actually was the highest scoring dog up there for the entire weekend, but we just we fell flat in the final four and we ended up placing fourth. But I was proud of the form that she'd done that weekend. I really was. And she was actually off of um, a mother son cross. That was the one he was referring to earlier. But her mama was Alice and her uh, daddy was Rudy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, I guess. See, I had I, the last time I went to the Grand American was probably like ninety five or ninety six. So it's been a while uh, yeah. s- since I've been there. And I guess their format is two night hunt, and then you have uh, the final four um, early Sunday morning. I guess it is. is that how that works? Yeah, that was the first year that the Grand American with her. They uh, it always was a single high scoring cast win, and then. You know, the, the high school from Friday, the two high schools from Friday, two high schools from Saturday, Saturday advanced to the final four. Well, the year she got in there, it changed the format to what it is now, which I like it a lot better. Double cast wins going to trump over a high score. So you had to have uh, the highest double scoring cast win got you in. And she actually was the, the highest scoring double cast winner. We had scored Friday night, I think we had like 375. And then Saturday we scored seven fifty with her, and uh, she, they put her high scoring double cast winner going into the final four. But like I said, that it was a tough fault cast that Saturday, and uh, that laying up in the truck for two hours, she stiffened up on me, and she she tried her best, but we just fell flat. So, is there any other bigger hunts that you've maybe traveled to uh, that you've hunted in? Yeah, my uh, Rudy dog actually was high school in Red Bone in the uh, 2008 AKC World Hunt when they had it down in South Carolina. I've been, I go to a lot of the state hunts like Virginia State and I've been to South Carolina State and I've gone to a lot of them. I've been to some bigger PKC hunts. Been to Tournament of Champions this past year. Yeah, I've been to Tournament of Champions. Red Bone Days. Yeah, we've been to several red bone days throughout the years where they have them across the country. So whenever you like travel, say like last year out to the tournament of champions from there, do, are you leaving a little early? Is your dogs just it don't bother them? They travel well. How, I know some people say they have trouble with their dogs. You know, when you're having to travel a long way, some dogs just don't travel good. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll leave a little early. I actually left early this year and hunted with a, a, 
a boy named Blake Wheeler down there in Georgia. He was nice enough to take me out pleasure hunting. And uh, I went out hunting with him to kind of get the dog acclimated down there. And because uh, I've always had little issues with the dogs. Some of them just don't travel too good. It takes them like a, a day or so to get their sea legs back under them and they'll perform like they ought to. I've only had one that I could haul from here to California that I think would be the same dog. And I'll, I'll touch on him because he's actually more up your line of dogs there. He's actually an English dog. I'll dabble into why, how I got in some English dogs also. <laughs> well, yeah, let's, let's hear it. Are you tired of whipping, scolding, and shocking to make them get alone? Is your buddy tired of helping you set your dog up for correction night after night? Do you really want your dog to be alone because you forced him to be? Or would you rather him be alone because he wants to be? Grand Knight Champion Small Town Lone Survivor is the product of over 25 years of strong natural born independent traits. This bold trait has been passed down from generation to generation and is showing up in Loner offspring today. Loner is a direct son of Hall of Fame Grand Knight Champion Cabin Creek Rowdy and Grand Knight Champion Lonesome Dove Lori. Loner has a booming mouth that is talked about in every cast he has been in, including the 2021 World Hunt Finals. Loner is a no-reverse, ball-mouth-open trailer who ends it plussed up with a huge dying locate and steady chop. Loner loves getting split and is a stay-put gun-pressure tree dog. Loner's intelligence is also impressive. He knows over 12 voice and hand signal commands. Loner has a character that loves like Jesus, but he doesn't walk on water. If you're interested in breeding to Loner, contact Brett Stevens at Small Town English Kennels at 417-300-3777 or find him on Facebook. If you're interested in running a stud ad for your dog here on the Coonhound Collective podcast, reach out to us at thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. Send us a message through Facebook or Instagram, and we'll be glad to get with you to get your ad bill and get your pricing on all of our ads. <laughs> um, way back when I was hunting Onion, right after he passed, um, we went to North Carolina State Hunt, and um, Onion had passed, and we were hunting Alice in it, and we we done good up there, but uh. Uh, there's a English dog man down our way named Joe Morris. He had a dog, I don't know if you remember, he was number one on our reproducers list there for a little while named Morris's Hard Time Booger. Well, uh, Mr. Joe didn't stay 15 minutes down the road from me, and we've known each other all these years. He had a litter of puppies down there, and my wife, I'm a, I'm a red dog fanatic. I love them, but my wife loves the English dogs. She loves them little speckled dogs to death. And, uh, she bought her a puppy, and uh, I ended up with that puppy, raised that puppy, and um, I was working a lot at the time, and we heard a scuss when the, she, she was about 15 months old. We sold her, and uh, sold her to uh, Darren Merritt down here, and um, he, he made her grand and done real good with her in the hunts, but uh, I kind of had stipulations when I sold her um, that I would get a pup whenever they bred her, and they bred her, I don't know, six, seven years later, she was an older dog, and they bred her to one of Irwin Masson's deals dogs. This is how I ended up getting up with Irwin, and I kept me a pup off of that. And uh, I got pickled in a pup. Irwin stood up to the deal. was a fine fella for that, and uh, I raised that puppy, and Irwin ended up coming and buying half of that little young dog from me, and he kind of really made a name for himself around here and, and everything. His name was Noose River Heat. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just buried Heat a couple months ago. He just passed away. But uh, we won a lot with, with Heat. And he uh, he actually, at one point in time, was sitting number two on the reproducers list for UKC. And he was a he was a special dog, not just for me, but for my family. But uh, I learned a lot with Irwin. I learned, uh, fortunately, he, he had taught me into getting some semen collected off of him. And that's something I learned also with my red dogs to Irwin as I've gone to get dogs collected just in case because sometimes you're going to run into a roadblock breeding and it don't hurt to dip back into the well and start back over. Okay, so I, I've, I've got I've got some questions now. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. You, 
So you, you pick up this English dog and you start hunting. It sounds like he was pretty successful, I would say, and sounds like a pretty good reproducer. So what made you, or, or do you still, I, I guess here, my first question is, do you still got English dogs in your kennel? Or are you just strictly hunting red bones? And if you're just strictly hunting red bones, what 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 made you not want to to continue on with the English? So, so let me answer this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Heat was a good dog. Um, he was a great dog, but um, Heat was actually trained by a red bone. And Irwin, if he was still alive, he would tell you this. We could take Heat out hunting, and we could take T out hunting, who's red bone, and she would teach he the lesson every night that we took them. Um, she she was a coon dog. But now the thing about the red bone breed that has been a little frustrating is you put T in a competition hunt and she didn't look the same as that English dog. Um, it was like, you know, pleasure hunting. She, you know, she could smoke everything out there and tree coons all night long. Um, but competition hunting, she got finicky around other dogs that she didn't know. Um, but anyway, so we, we, um, we raised some puppies off of heat, you know, obviously he's, he's got a lot of pups out there, but we felt like as long as he was living, we didn't want to hunt anything else, um, English dog wise, but now that he's passed on, we probably will be pulling semen and breeding him pretty soon. Yeah, it won't be long. I'll have another English dog in my kennel. We've got some, some little females in the works that we're going to use some of this semen. I've had it stored for about. 10 years so i'm going to use me a little bit of it he's he's gone now okay and the reason why i ask that is because i i'm actually a black and tan guy um uh-huh. the, the first dog that i bought with with my own money or half my money half my dad's was a black and tan and i mean to the point i took my senior pictures in high school with this dog uh which my mom and dad wasn't real happy about but <laughs> um when I got back into hunting, um, when, whenever we moved from Alabama to Missouri, I had gotten out. When I got back into hunting, I started hunting some plot dogs for a guy out of West Virginia. And whenever I was able to get my own dogs again, I started back with black and tans. And the little black and tan dog I was talking about that passed away, he was really, you know, like I said, he was making a nice dog. And I like a lot of the stuff I was seeing out of him, but you know, when he passed away, I had a couple other little black dogs that I was messing with, but nothing that was his caliper. And I just hadn't seen anything that, that I liked. And I ended up with this, uh, uh English female and I, and it, it wasn't that I liked so much that how she hunted or her mouth or anything like that. I had never been around a hound that was an, as an intelligent dog as she was. And so now I have this young male dog here that's completely unrelated to this female that I have. And he, he's, he's got drive, he's got heart, he's got go, but in all of that, he's got brains. And that's what I, that's what I couldn't have found out that I liked about those few black dogs that I had was the few that I had here and there, uh, out of that line, they had brains and that's, and that's something I've got to have a dog that's willing to, to, to listen and can, can take some command and some instruction, you know, when needed to and, and not act like an idiot. Yeah. And a lot of mine, uh, heat won't that way. Uh, but the red dog line I had were kind of like what you said, highly intelligent. Matter of fact, we'll get the Jaeger here in a little bit. That's the one I'm hunting now that I'm really pushing, but, uh, Rudy, Alice, Leroy, which was Jaeger's daddy, which is a, a story on its own to give on Leroy, but um, they all were voice command. They listened as good as anybody's duck dog. I never had to put a leash on a dog. They never broke my side. Um, I could voice command them right off the tree to go right back hunting. They, was just, they were just pure pleasurable to hunt, and that's kind of what I've always enjoyed doing. I like, I like a dog that's got a handle on it like that. Yeah, I, I, well, me, me, me too. That's that's the probably one of the most important traits that a dog has to have is I I've got to be able to handle that dog, um, and and even more so now as I've gotten older and I'm hunting in a lot rougher terrain than what I was originally used to. 
you know, even just leading a dog out of the woods or, you know, being able to get a dog back to you if you need need to, which thankfully, you know, I, I don't have to do that very often. They get treed somewhere and I, I can get into them and get, get them and get out. But, um, you know, that, that handle to me is the most important part of the tool package that I, I can put on a dog. Yeah, I agree. And um, I was also told by a lot of the older guys that your best coon dogs are your most intelligent ones. You know, you can't you can't teach a, a stupid dog new tricks, but you can teach a smart one some new tricks. And I've always I've come to find out a lot of the, the dogs I had were extremely intelligent, were the better at tree and layup coons, and they could figure stuff out that a lot of dogs would quit on. They wouldn't quit; they'd figure it out and get that coon tree. And that's one of the other reasons why I've always liked a highly intelligent dog. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, you had heat there. You had, had the English dog. Did, did you have other, um, r- red dogs? I, I'm assuming you did at, at the same time you were hunting him, uh, that you were yeah. pushing in competition hunts. Um, I mainly had him and T and then, um, Leroy was the same age, which is going, Leroy was off of Rudy and, a a Ruby female I bought. And she was the one that was a uh, niece to the onion dog. So this is where onion ties back into my line. But um, I went and I said, Onion couldn't have no puppy, so I went to Mr. Dow Hill, which he's passed to. He raised him line of dogs for, I don't know, 40 years. And um, I started with that line of dog on trying to breed that in because Onion was such an exceptional hound itself. And uh, I got Leroy. <laughs> Leroy was a adventure, to say the least. <laughs> um, Leroy started out like most of my puppies started out real good. I'm talking about real good. And just for some reason one night just lost interest in treeing completely. And went for a while just wanted to run track and not tree and I never could get him back treeing. I messed with him for about a year. And I got frustrated and was ready to give up on Leroy. And my wife done the same thing she loves to do. She stepped in and took Leroy and said that he could be mine. That's my baby. Well, I kind of gripe the guys around the house. They ain't going to like me saying this, but I run deer with Leroy for about three years. Put him in the deer pack. He run deer for me. We made a, a good deer dog. Well, by that fourth year running deer, he got where he didn't want to run deer. And all of a sudden, he went to tree and coons during the middle of the day. Decided he won't start back tree. And I said, well, dang on. I, you don't want to run a deer. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll coon hunt you. Well, he made a exceptional coon dog in his later years of life. <laughs> we, uh, I put him in some local hunts and made him a night champion of like four hunts, I think. And boy, I was ragging them around here. Telling them they were losing to an old deer, broke down deer dog, couldn't be the deer dog, but you know, I was just messing with him. But he, he taught me a, a valuable lesson. To, sometimes you, there is late bloomers out there if you can stick with them. <laughs> yeah, well, I actually have one in my kennel that you know, she, me and me and a buddy of mine ha, kind of have her together. She She's his dog, but um, he told me, you know, if I can get her doing something that. You know, we we partner on her, and uh, he's he's tried and tried until he's frustrated with her, and she's getting a little age, you know, on her a little, little more than a puppy. And um, but boy, you talk about a mouth on a female, and she's she 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 was having a little trouble treeing, kind of like what what you were talking about there, and not not wanting to not wanting to stay treed, and she's she's come along and starting to tree now a little more, and I told him he she just needed to change the scenery. Yeah, and uh, I said with Leroy, he was just, he was a character. I've never had a dog that run deer for three years so good with a deer pack. Just just up and quit, and it, to the day he died, he might well bump one every now and then for a few hundred yards, but he was done running deer and wanted to tree coons. Just did it naturally. Just finally, I guess the bubble turned in his head, like they like to say, and he figured out what he was supposed to do. Yeah, well... I don't think I've ever had it go that way, but I've had it go the other way where they make good deer dogs. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, he he was an adventure, <laughs> but he had just passed to uh, him and he were on about four or five months apart in age. And um, when he got, uh, Leroy got to be about, I don't know, eight years old. Um, 
a guy, another guy that had started this line with um the the Amos dog I had come from a uh, Don Whitley, but he had actually come from Mr. Stacy Parker down here in Four Oaks. He's he had a, a line of red bones called the Deuce River Red Bones he's had since the seventies. And Amos was off of his line of dogs and I got to know Stacy and got to be good friends with Stacy over the years. And uh Stacy had a female he wanted to breed and um uh, asked me would I breed her back to Leroy. And I did and I bred her back to Leroy and I got three puppies out of it, two two females and a male and I kept the male and um uh, because I knew that was gonna probably be Leroy's last litter and that's where I got my yellow dog that I got now from. And uh the other two puppies really made nice dogs that I know. I know one in South Carolina was making a good dog, but I know they went to breeding her. But I know the other one's down here on the coast of North Carolina, and she's she's a real nice little hound. They just don't comp- – she's in a pleasure hunter's hands, and they don't care nothing about competition hunting. But Jaeger has actually come about as close to my tea dog as I've had out of all of them. He's got a little bit – I'm going to say he's got the talent that my Trudy dog had for tea. But he does not have none of the curiousness to him. I finally have got, with at least with him, that curiousness out. It has been kind of a, a thing running rampant with my dogs. They've always been a little bit on the peculiar side about folks and other dogs, almost like one-man dogs. But um, he is he's really made a, a nice hound for me. So how many generations did you see that? you know, kind of the one man dog type thing before you, before you got it out, before you got the Jaeger here. Uh, Jaeger's going to actually probably be the first. A lot of them, Leroy was a little, Leroy was a little bit better. Rudy was really curious and all, but Leroy was, uh, won't no ways as bad. Leroy just, when you turn them out, he had to, uh, he had to smell everybody in the cast. And then he'd go hunting. He wouldn't just take right off hunting. He'd stop me, go up and smell everybody's leg. What, be aggressive or nothing like that. He just he had to smell everybody to see what he was with. Then he just mosey on his own way. He, you know, he just it started with Leroy getting out of it some. But I think Mr. Stacy's line they were real curious and I, I didn't really double up on that. And I uh I got away and started doubling up on some lines because the line I had got from Stacy were extremely independent. And that's something I really like in a dog is independence. I'd rather have a dog that's by itself 90% of the time. And uh, his dogs were like that. So I uh, I started getting away from that, doubling up on the other good line, because I was scared if I kept doubling up on that, I was going to keep getting that curiousness in them. Jaeger has, what, five generations of Tar River Red Bones? Yeah, and, yeah he's, um, he's a fifth-generation dog I've raised here at the house. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I know, you know, sometimes you're either trying to get something in and get something out and, um, you know, sometimes that takes some time to be able to, to come up with, with the right combination there to, to get it out. So wasn't sure there how, how, you know, that, that come about there. So, um, did, did we miss any other dogs in there or, or you ain't got another breed there that you're going to throw in on me, are you? <laughs> No, no, I ain't got no uh, no other breed that I've messed with. Just mainly, I've been known around here for English dogs. I've always been kind of the uh, English and red bone man around here. But I kind of, I reckon most of the country didn't realize that he was owned, actually owned by a red bone man. But it's out there now. He was owned by a red bone man. Mr. Irwin promoted him, but we were behind the scenes hunting him. And he stayed in our yard um, most of his life, other than a short stint when he went up north for a little while. But, uh, no, that's we're pretty much caught up to where my Jaeger dog is now. And that's what I'm hunting. I've, I've bred him one time. He's six. And I, I said, I've not raised, raised many. I've actually got one litter of pups off of them that's about a year and a half doing real good and uh we just made one more cross these pups are probably i don't know four or five weeks old i got some high hopes for them well let's let's talk about the future of your kennel what what are what what are some goals that you have that you that you want to see hit with your kennel and is there anything in particular that you, you that you really want to try to strive to do with with any of your dogs uh, yeah, my goals is to 
to just keep promoting the, the style of dog like I got and have had to try to keep it going. I, I've, I've seen it happen a lot of years. Some, you, you run into a, a roadblock. I like to call it a roadblock. Sometimes you can have the best dog in the world and he just don't seem to be able to reproduce. That dog can't. And um, that's kind of the reason why Erwin always taught me into get some semen collected on dogs that you knew could reproduce to, to start back over. But is to kind of continually produce a, a top tier dog that can compete with these walkers and these English and everything else. We might can't beat them all the time, but we want to be able to be in the running. I want to be that man. I want my dog to be a dog that they talk about. Man, that's a red bone I'd love to have, regardless whether I win or not. Um, goal wise, hunt goals is a hunt that's always evaded me. Um, is the Grand American? I would love to win that. I've come close that year with make when I made the final four, and I, I almost made the final four one year with Heat. We uh we missed it by one coon getting in the final four, but uh that's a hunt that I've always strived to try to win. It's kind of to me that's the Super Bowl of hunts around here because that's I've been all over the country and that's probably the biggest hunt I've been to dog wise and. You know, actual event held on a weekend. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Chris uh, Harley. I just had him on the podcast, and that was he. He he got it got it done this year, and he said that was that was one of the hunts he had been after been after to win for sure. And um, yeah, he, I actually grew Chris a couple of years ago when he placed first with with uh, his dog down there. He scored 1100. I was on that cast with him. Okay. Okay. Well, um, man, we, we covered a lot, a lot of information there and, and, and you kind of throwed me a, a curveball there with the, with the English dogs. I wasn't expecting that one for sure, but, uh, is there anything we missed or, or anything else that, that you wanted to talk about before we get to the end here? Cause we've been at it almost an hour. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is one thing I, I see a lot of, I don't know how it is in your area, but a lot of the local hunts around here, are dwindling you know i know coon hunting is kind of a, a dying sport you know but um i've done a lot of accolades and done a lot of winning throughout the country with dogs you know and and they had a fair amount of success but i'm going to say you the most proudest i've ever been is we got a youth hunt down here um a local club holds and my little girl has won it two out of the last three years with jaeger and i have been more proud of that dog and my daughter winning that than anything else and that's something i love to see is more people you know getting the, the children in the sport and keeping it going because you know i've got a lot of enjoyment out of it and my my little girl does now and i it may it means more to me to see kids in the sport than anything else well that is the future uh of our sport for sure and you know if you get an opportunity to take a kid coon hunting i i always say load them up in the truck give them a light and and turn them loose in the woods for sure because uh that is that's that's the that's the future of it and i have two teenagers here in the house and i just about burnt mine out hunting puppies um you know so they wasn't seeing a lot of game in the trees because all i was hunting was young dogs and you out there night after night after night and you know it just it, it it's just one of those things you have to go through when you're hunting puppies and so I about burnt mine out, so I wouldn't recommend doing that, but I would definitely recommend putting putting young kids in the woods with a, with a light and a good dog. Yeah, that, and to all the other hunters listening, just support your local clubs, because without them, you wouldn't, a lot of these dogs wouldn't have the titles they got on them today without the local clubs, because I've actually have run two local clubs throughout my years, and I run one now, and, you know, this is, if you want it to keep going competition coon hunting, you have to start at the local level and have to support your local clubs. Yeah, I couldn't agree more there. You know, if you're out there and you're listening and you're showing up to the same local club um, month after month or weekend after weekend to hunt that competition hunt, find out when they have their club meetings or club hunts. And, you know, usually the, the fees to join a, a club is fairly inexpensive they don't really make anything off of it's 10 or 20 bucks to to join for the whole year a lot of times that's for your entire family um i would i always highly recommend joining the club and also um i, I 
pushed this several times on here, but join your breed association. That that goes a long way and um, helping putting monies in, in different places and helping uh, helping grow a group of, of hunters. And, you know, the, our hunting is always under attack by the antis, and we, we all need to stick together, where, whether it's coon hunting, deer hunting, uh, squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting. We, we need to stick together, and one way we can do that is support those uh, bigger breed associations so that when we do have an issue that they have the monies that it takes to, to fight and protect our interest. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, because uh, if you ain't careful with, within another generation there won't be no more hunt left if we ain't careful what's going on yeah that that is for sure well um i told you about 30 minutes to an hour and um we we are at 58 minutes so we, all right we we are right right at an hour and i don't want to hold you up on a sunday afternoon i do appreciate you and your wife taking the time to to be on a podcast but uh, before i let you go is there anything else you'd like to add or anybody you'd like to thank or uh no just to all the local guys out there and all your local clubs the guys that all run in the clubs you know whether just thank everybody for running your local clubs keeping them going and keeping the coon house sport for the younger generation that's who i really want to thank because uh without them running the clubs the guys behind the scenes you wouldn't uh we wouldn't be where we are today with competition hunts and other than that uh that should be it i i really enjoyed talking with you well, I, like I said, I really appreciate y'all taking y'all's time on a Sunday afternoon to sit down with me and record this and get some more information out there about uh, some red bones. And, you know, they had a, a good breed hunt here in Louisiana for PKC here just a couple of weeks ago. And I talked to, uh, I've had T-Mac on the podcast and I, and I talked to him through text messaging and it sounds like they had a good show and definitely had a good payout um for that breed uh, uh, association down there so you know we we try to spread it around don't make it all about english dogs or walker dogs and we want to have uh some some different breeds on here to talk about them and, and help promote each breed um there's something out there for everybody so that's that's our goal here yeah and that's a that's a hunt i'm planning on attending in the future is that that hunt they hold on the cruise but i i keep up with it they, they seem like they're they're holding a real good hunt and if anybody's you ain't you know it's an open event after that thursday night you know anybody's in that area that sounds like that's a real good hunt to go to yeah it did it, it looked look, the pictures i've seen and the videos i've seen it definitely definitely looked like a good hunt and uh i i would uh i would highly recommend if you're in that area when they hold it to uh to try to be a part of it for sure uh, Adrian, we just clicked over one hour and I, I, I want to keep, keep my word to you that I, I'd only keep y'all about an hour. And I really do appreciate y'all being part of the podcast today and helping spread the word about some red bones a, a little bit, and especially the red bones in your area. Thank you. Thank you. And you have a good day. Yes, sir. You too. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for listening to the Coonhound Collective Podcast today. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to listen to the podcast. If you don't mind, head over to Facebook and give us a like, and head over to Instagram and give us a follow. It's both at The Coonhound Collective. Also, if you would like to reach us here at The Coonhound Collective, you can reach us at thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. If there's someone that you would like to hear on the podcast or a product that you would like to hear talked about, please send it to thecoonhoundcollective at gmail.com. Thanks again. Have a great day.